Good morning, words sir. Can we stand up? Come on. So we're going to do something a little differently this morning. How many of you know that in the name of Jesus, we've been given freedom? Amen? Amen. Oh, come on, church. That doesn't sound like a room full of free people. How many people know that in the name of Jesus, we've been given freedom? Amen? Amen. Amen. There we go. Well, we're not just called out of the grave of death, but we're called out of the grave of shame and guilt. So can we turn to each other this morning and just give each other a moment of encouragement? Because we're going to tell each other, you got to get up out of that grave. Come on. you got to get up out of that grave and praise. we got to get up out of that grave and be in freedom, okay? So come on. Let's turn to each other. Let's sing. Here we go. And get up, get up, get up, get up out of that grave. Come on. Get up, get up, get up. I'll say it to each get other. Get up out of that grave. Come on.
Observe. It is good to see you here. Are we thankful? Amen. Amen. I'm going to invite you to please be seated. We're going to cover a couple of things real quick, and then we'll get right back into worship. First of all, thank you for being here. I'm thankful that you're here. Otherwise, it would be weird for me, right? Uh, so we're going to put the connection card QR code up here. You can take your phone. You can snap that. Uh, that lets you let us know that you're here. Why would you want to do that, you ask? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is it lets us know you're here. It also is an opportunity for you to give any prayer requests that you have. We have a team of people that would love to pray for you, come alongside you. So however we can help, let us know. And then it also uh, will put you onto the e-news list. There's a lot of stuff that goes on. Even though we're a small church, we are doing stuff all the time. So if you want the e-news, that'll come to you in your e-box. Your e-box. <laughs> 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 Did I mention I haven't had enough coffee yet? <laughs> in your inbox. That's what I was trying to say. And if you ever get tired of that, just unsubscribe. It ain't no big thing. So there's no harm in filling out the connection card. We will not stalk you. I promise. The other thing we talk about is giving. We just did a, t a sermon series on time, talent, and treasure. There's all kinds of ways that you can give. You can give of your time. You can give of your talent, as you see up here. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that we don't see that you do every day that makes WordServe have an impact for Christ in the community. So don't underestimate whatever it is that God has put into you as an ability or an experience or a talent. It can be used in a mighty, mighty ways. So we encourage you to look at that always. If you have questions, please get with me. I would love to sit down and talk with you about how to find your passion. And I'm going to give you an example in just a minute. Uh, actually, I'm going to give you an example right now. If you haven't checked out WordSurf's social media, you need to check it out. If you're an Instagram person, if you're a Facebook person, check out WordSurf Church. And here's how that all went down. One day I had a conversation with a guy who said, I, I, I want to do something for the church. And I found out one of his passions was social media. And I was like, ooh, hey, have I got a deal for you? So uh, Jaron's going to be embarrassed I mentioned his name, Jaron. But, but Jaron has done a great job <laughs> of boosting our social media. <laughs> yeah. And uh, he, he catches me at the most untoward times, like when I'm all sweaty and nasty. He says, hey, can you do a five-minute show or a, a 30-second spiel on something? I'm like, oh, okay, sure, yeah. But hey, it's, it's working. So, And why do I mention this? Because this is the best way to evangelize in today's environment. If you, wanna, you, know, if you heard something that appeals to you, if you got a 30-second clip and you forwarded that to somebody, man, maybe that's all the difference. It may, it, all it, it takes to make a difference for them. Right, So this is a great way to get the message out there. And it's not about me. It's not about word serve. It's about Jesus Christ. So what a great way to, to evangelize, to get the message out there for hope. The last thing I'll say about giving is it does take money because a lot of the things that we do, Operation Christmas Child, the faithful kids, the service into the community, all takes money. Uh, how many people like having a roof over your head and air conditioning or heat at the appropriate time? All these kinds of things, they do take money. We're not going to lie, but we will be good stewards with whatever we've been given. So uh, if you would like to give, there's lots of ways that you can do that there. Speaking of Operation Christmas Child, there's a lot of boxes that are available right here. You can take these and pack them and bring them back next week. Uh, there are Each box goes to a child somewhere in the world. They, it's full, full of toys and things, but it also is the message of Christ to them. And we've seen plenty of examples where that one yo-yo made all the difference in some kid's life that has now grown up. So please, please, please take these boxes uh, and pack them and bring them back so we can bless people around the world. Uh, the other thing I'll say is, uh, well, there's two things, actually. Today is the day to bring them back if you want the postage paid. WordServe pays the postage on them. If you forgot, if you haven't got that, and you've got boxes that you want to bring back, get with either Mike or Cindy Haas. Cindy's right next to me. That's convenient. Thank you. Um, let them know it's coming, and, and we'll make some allowances for that. That's okay. Uh, and the latest change, don't use rubber bands. Use tape. I don't know why that's important, but it is. So anyway, that's Operation Christmas Child stuff. And tonight, the youth will be packing Operation Christmas Child boxes. We do have some supplies. Uh, also, if you are looking for some supplies, we have some uh, extraneous stuff. So there's no reason not to do this. Speaking of youth, the other things that are coming up, uh, there is no youth on the 19th. That is the first week of Thanksgiving break. But December 2nd, save the date. Please be at the city center, because at the Fulcher Christmas Tree Lighting, the band, I'm not, not even the opening, it is the band, is the Word Serve Youth Band. How awesome is that, right? So please, please, please come out and support. And if I've forgotten anything, uh, I'll make it up later. So thank you, and back to Jimmy. Thank you. Well, let's stand together. Hi, everybody. Hello. So much we have lost as we look down. 
Presence will just renew us and refresh us. We give you thanks. We give you thanks, Lord. Because of what you gave, you are here in our midst, in our very hearts right now in these moments. So God, just like we started this morning with, God, call us out of the grave, the grave of shame that we carry. Even though we sing your freedom, there's so much shame that weighs us down in this room. Even though we sing your freedom, there's so much guilt that weighs us down in this room. But you are the way maker. You carved a path where there was no way forward. And in your precious, perfect, and beautiful name, you call us out of that shame. You call us out of that guilt. So God, help us be a people that live like we're called out of our shame, like we're called out of our guilt. Help us show the world that there is a way forward. we're hurting, that when we're struggling, there is a Savior that's listening. Let us live that testimony, God. And if there's hurt and there's hearts in this room that need that healing, God, I just pray right now that we wouldn't rush through these moments, God, because you are here, moving in our midst, working in our hearts. So if it's emotional things, if it's financial things, if it's physical healing, God, I just pray the name of Jesus over everything in this room this morning. God, help give us the courage to lean into you and trust this morning.
stop working. Your creation is your joy. And you made us in your image redeemed by your son. A love that we could never comprehend. That is who you are. You are the loving creator. You are a sustaining savior. That is who you are. I encourage you this morning reflect if you've known his great mercy and love if you've known his deliverance and his healing i just encourage you give him a shout of praise worship him this morning because he is worth it. that is who you are lord we just give a hallelujah come on church hallelujah we worship you lord and that is who you are but you are the way maker you are the sustainer you are the provider Come on, we sing. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working.
this morning, God, that that is family. The way for the Praise, come on. Jesus paid it all, all to him I own. We're so grateful this morning, Sin Lord, come on. Has, has left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Sin had left a crimson stain, he God, remind us of who you are this morning. As we come here with all our stuff, all the things of the world clinging to us, all the sin, all the shame, all the guilt, all of that, you can take it away. You already have through your son, Jesus Christ, and for that we are grateful today. God, remind us of who you are. In the times of darkness, you are the light that shows the way. In the times where there seems to be no way, you are the way maker. When there seems to be no hope, nothing left. You are the miracle worker. You are who you've always been. It's we who forget. God, and on this weekend, I want to pray a special prayer for veterans in honor of Veterans Day and their service. We thank you for those who serve. In many capacities, we all have ways that we can serve. But for these men and women, we are grateful for their gift of sacrifice and service for their willingness to do whatever it takes to preserve the freedoms that we enjoy. And God, we thank you most of all for the most important sacrifice, your son, Jesus Christ, who gives us the greatest freedom, the freedom from sin and even the power of death. For these things, we are grateful. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Well, good morning again. My name is Pastor Bill. If I didn't get a chance to meet you, I would love to meet you after the service. I usually stand right by the door, and if not, um, come and find me. I, I do like to talk to people. <laughs> well, we're, uh, we're starting a sermon series called The Gratitude Challenge. I'm kind of excited about this. It is the time of year where we give thanks. It's coming up on Thanksgiving. You're going to have a Thanksgiving week. You might spend it with family. I'll leave that to you if that's the thing to be thankful or not. Uh, that's up to you. But I just want to give you some tools and techniques to help you practice gratitude. So here's where we're going to go over the next few weeks. Today we're going to practice gratitude. Then we're going to talk about enduring gratitude. Because once gratitude starts to fade, everything changes. It's not a good scene. And then finally, returning gratitude. The idea that once lost, if, if you have lost the ability to be grateful, you can get it back. In fact, it's always been there. It's just a matter of how do we conduct ourselves. So all these things are designed to give you all the tools you need for this Thanksgiving. 
And this Thanksgiving, uh, the reason I'm doing this series isn't just because it's Thanksgiving. There's actual research, scientific research, that backs this idea that gratitude is actually good for us in many ways. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about that throughout this series. I'm going to show you a little bit of science. I'm going to show you a lot of Bible. I'm going to show you a little bit of Jesus. And it's all going to come together to convince us that gratitude is a good, good thing. Not just because we're supposed to, but because that's the way that we're wired, for one. So let me ask you, when it comes to uh, gratitude, uh, how many people practice gratitude on a regular basis? Okay, not bad. Now you may be, oh, I don't know, what do you mean, Bill? What do you mean by practice gratitude? Well, how many people say thanks to God? How many people say thanks to others? How many people keep maybe a gratitude journal where you write down what you're grateful for and then go back and look at that? Uh, how many people take a meditative practice of ruminating on scripture? There's a word we don't use enough, ruminating. I dare you to use that in a conversation this week. So we, we talk about, think about scripture and let it kind of go throughout our entire being and it results in gratitude. Have you ever had that experience? If you haven't, man, I encourage you to spend some time in that because it's profound, it's deep. It's not just a, hey, thanks for what you do. It's a, whoa, look at what I've been given. It's amazing. So here's what I want you to do. I want to, I'm going to take a little two-part survey, but this is a private survey, okay? You don't have to share your answers with anyone, but I do want you to make an effort on this because this is going to show you that gratitude is good. I want you to rate yourself on a scale of 1 to 10 on how well you practice gratitude. And I want you to write it down because we're going to come back to it in the next two weeks. So on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do you practice gratitude? 1, I'm terrible at it. 10, I'm like Mother Teresa. All right, so... Somewhere in between is probably where most of us are, but, but be honest with yourself. How well do you practice gratitude? And write that number down. Everybody got it? Or y'all got steel trap memories, because I don't see anybody writing anything down. All right. Bill just says stuff, and we don't really do it, but no, okay. <laughs> All right, so write that number down, one to ten. How well do you practice gratitude? Because here's the second part that I want you to track. And again, this is private. This is just for you. On a scale of one to ten, how much anxiety do you encounter? One is, I, I'm terribly anxious. Ten is, I don't have a clue, right? So, because <laughs> if you're not anxious, you don't have a clue, right? But you're maybe nine or so, you're, you're not anxious at all, all right? So on a scale of one to ten, one, I'm very anxious all the time. Ten, I have no anxiety whatsoever. And write that number down. Now, if you did this exercise, I hope you're going to find that there's an inverse correlation, meaning the more grateful I am, the less anxious I am. The more anxious I am, the less grateful I am. There's an actual tie. And over the weeks uh, coming ahead, I'm going to try to show you the connection. It's backed by science, but God figured it out first. How do I know this? Because this is where the story begins. There is a connection between gratitude and anxiety, and gratitude and good mental health. And it starts in the very, very beginning. If you got your Bibles or your apps, Genesis chapter 2 doesn't get much more beginning than that, right? The setting is God is creating. That's what God does. He creates the world. He then creates man to come into the world, and the sole purpose of this person is what? To care for creation. That is why we are here, to care for God's creation and to glorify God. So we pick up the story. Uh, I'm just going to actually read just one verse because it's, it's a good one. Uh, it says this in verse 7. Then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. These are the words of God for the people of God, and for these words we are grateful. Man became a living being. God breathed into his nostrils. Now, when you read scripture, sometimes you go, what? Does that seem unusual that you would breathe into someone's nostrils? I mean, I don't do that on a daily basis. I don't know about you. But it seems odd that they would pick that. And it seems odd also that God's breath would be uh, this, this thing that makes man come alive. But think about this. Did we do anything to earn breath? Did we do anything that says breath is my right? Or is it a gift? I think it's a gift. But here's the cool thing. It's the gift that keeps on giving. If you were here last week when I talked about my episode with the collapsed lung, I take zero breaths for granted. If you've ever been without breath, you will never take breath for granted again. I promise you. 
even though I still do it, right? I, I do. I, I slip into that take-for-granted thing. But it's not something that you think about. You're not sitting there thinking, breathe in, breathe out. Well, maybe you are. <laughs> but, but I don't, right? We don't. T- this is something that God has given us that just keeps on going. We don't have to think about it. You slept last night. Were you aware of your breathing? No, your spouse was if you snore. But you weren't, <laughs> right? You were not aware of your breath. But yet, here we are with another day given to us, and breath in our lungs and strength in our limbs and a Savior to celebrate in a world that needs to know that. See, that is something to be grateful for, that breath. And it's, it's interesting that this is the gift that keeps on giving, always keeps on giving. So think about that for a second. And, and when it comes to the physical breath, think about all the things. If that doesn't amaze you enough, think about all the things that goes into breath. I mean, basically what we're doing is we're taking in oxygen. Uh, if high school science teachers, pardon me for my sixth grade explanation, but... That we're taking in oxygen, it goes into our lungs, it has this magic thing, these little air pockets that transform that oxygen into the bloodstream. It's carried throughout our bodies to energize cellular respiration, right? Our entire body is alive with this stuff, but in the process of that, it makes some bad stuff. It makes some CO2. Well, if that builds up, that's bad news. So what do we do? Well, we take that right back out, we put it in the lungs, and then it comes back out. And how often do you think about that? Like never, right? I mean, we are walking miracles. It's a miracle, first of all, that the oxygen is the right amount that we need. Secondly, that it gets to where it needs to go. And as the waste product is produced, it comes back out. And God's not done yet because he takes what is bad and makes it good again so we can breathe it back in. Is that not something to be thankful for? I kind of feel like Gladiator. Are you not entertained? You know, is that not something to be thankful for, right? <laughs> Yeah, of course it is, but we take this for granted, and here's my first point. Gratitude can be simple, everyday things. In fact, I'm convinced that that's part of my problem with gratitude. See, there was a time in my life when I wasn't as grateful, and I'm still working on gratitude, don't get me wrong. I'm not Mother Teresa over here, right? But there was a point where I was like, man, I got big expectations. I have career expectations. I have family expectations, and if they're not just perfect, then I'm not grateful. It doesn't have to be that big. In fact, it's the things that we take for granted so often that we should be most grateful for, like breath. Breath is such a a common thing and such a trendy thing. There's a New York Times book written about breath. And this is one of many, by the way. If you haven't read this book, it's fascinating. I will tell you there's some places where breath control and things get a little weird. But the basic thing is if we breathe right, we breathe well, we're healthy. We breathe wrong, not so healthy. Turns out, according to James Nestor in the book Breath and Scientific Research, that breathing through your mouth all the time is not so good for you. You should breathe through your nose. Did you know that? There's my first public service announcement. Yeah. And why is that? Well, when you breathe through your nose, it does a few things. First of all, it filters the air. That's why you get nose hair trimmers for Christmas, right? (laughs) Just saying. Oh, maybe you don't. <laughs> so it, it actually filters out. But there's more than that. It's also a membrane that it passes through. So while it's passing through that, it's absorbing all those microscopic things that keep us healthy. And all that stuff that would be coming into our lungs gets filtered there as well. It also warms and moistens the air so it's better used in the lungs. So if you're continually breathing through your mouth, I think there's a reason that society calls that a mouth breather. (laughs) It's not as good as a nose breather. Maybe that's why God breathed into the nostrils. I don't know. I'm just saying, there's all kinds of things. Now you're thinking, Bill, this is getting weird. This is like like new age breathing stuff. No, I promise there's going to be a connection to scripture. There's going to be a connection to gratitude. There's going to be a connection to God. Hang with me. Bear with me. All right, so the practice of the breath. What happens is all of those things that I just described, but you don't really get that. I mean, you get it here. But you don't get it here until you do this exercise with me, if you're brave. All right, so here's what we're going to do. Oxygen is a good thing. We are going to take in as much oxygen as we have, and then because we don't know if there's going to be enough, we're going to hold on to that oxygen. Basically what I'm saying is we're going to take a deep breath and hold it. Okay, everybody ready? 
Hold it while I talk. All right, good. So while you're holding your breath, let me explain what's going on in your body. You've just taken in a bunch of oxygen. It's gotten into your alveoli, and it's going to be distributed through your bloodstream. This is a good thing. You're feeling pretty good right now, but the longer I talk and the longer you hold your breath, there's also waste products starting to build in your system. Those waste products are called CO2. Those waste products are signaling your body that this is not good and I need to get rid of this, but I can't because this person won't let me. So what's starting to happen right now is your heartbeat is starting to elevate just a little bit. There's a part of your brain that I can't pronounce that is telling you, you need to breathe, you need to breathe. Right now it's not bad, but give me 10 more seconds, and it'll be, you need to breathe, you need to breathe, you need to breathe, you need to breathe. And your heart rate starts to accelerate. Your extremities start to shut down so the blood flow is preserved. Is everybody still holding their breath? No, you, we're long gone. Okay, good. Did you feel the effects? Right? I, couldn't, I was waiting for, you know. Did you feel the effects? Did you feel anxious? Anybody feel anxious? Yeah. So you, I have just proven to you that there is a connection between how we breathe and anxiety. And science will back me on this. There is a connection between how we breathe and how anxious we are. Almost like God knew what he was doing when he wired us and gave us noses to breathe through. <laughs> But similarly, when we take in a good thing, we can't just hold it. This was part of what I said last week. We've got to give it back. And so there's going to be an element of this where we talk about not just the physical breath, but the spiritual breath as well. Now, before I get off the physical breath, let me tell you that I'm not just making this up because there's a group of people that are very serious about how they breathe. Anybody know who these people are? Navy SEALs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you know that part of their training is breath control? Yeah, it's called box breathing. And if you don't believe me, tune into any podcast and you'll hear all about it. This is box breathing, the Navy SEAL method. The reason they call it a box breathing is you breathe in for four to five seconds, you hold it for four to five seconds, you breathe out for four to five seconds, you hold the exhale for four to five seconds, and you breathe in. And when you breathe in, by the way, don't go and then tense up, right? You keep it open. Hold it for five seconds. And completely, not like, like completely, from the diaphragm, squeeze every ounce of air out that you can. Hold that for five seconds. Breathe in for five seconds and continue that and focus on your breath. Anybody want to guess what results that will produce in you? It might slow the metabolism. Yeah. Lower the heart rate. What happens with the lower heart rate? What happens to your stress? Your stress is reduced. What happens to your focus? Your focus is increased. Do you think this might be important if you have a stressful job? Yeah, Navy SEALs do this in the mid, not because you're like, I'm out in the middle of this battlefield. And I'm like, oh, no, they're not doing that stuff, right? <laughs> they're out there doing box breathing because it gives them increased clarity, increased focus, reduced stress. They can make better decisions on the fly. Now, if Navy SEALs do this, I think it's worth checking into, don't you? So I would love to encourage you to practice this box breathing. It actually impacts the parasympathetic system. Like it sends signals to your body that all is well. And then your brain starts to believe it and your brain can make better decisions. So there, there's something about this breath and how it interacts with our body that just fascinates me. And James Nestor too, apparently. He's a New York Times bestseller. So think about how to do the, uh, the box breathing method and uh, you will be money ahead. Now, Bill, this still sounds new agey. Where is Jesus? Never fear. Jesus is here. In John chapter 20, there's a very curious passage. You know how I said sometimes you read the Bible and you go, what? Well, check this out. In John 22, let me give you the setting. Jesus has been crucified and dead and buried. And he is risen again. And he is looking for the disciples. And guess where the disciples are? They're in a locked room because they're afraid. They're all in fear behind a locked door. It literally says that in Scripture. On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, he said, Show them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. This is important. As the Father sent me, I am sending you. Hang on to that thought. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. What? Can you, 
I just had this picture of Jesus popping into the room. Hey, man, peace out. <sighs> Receive the Holy Spirit, right? No, that's not what it is. The interesting thing about this word, breath and spirit, are very similar in the Hebrew language. They're also very similar in the Greek language. Pneuma is spirit in the Greek. When you have pneumonia, what does it affect? Your lungs, your breathing, right? When you have a pneumothorax, what is that? I know, it's a collapsed lung, right? It's the air that we breathe. But it's also more than just air, it's the spirit. When Jesus is breathing on them, if you go back to where it says in the beginning, when God breathed into his nostrils, what? The breath of life. It's not just a physical breath that God breathes into us. God has breathed into us his spirit. And his spirit is what comes into us. It is up to us how we use it and then how we give that back. That's the way the spiritual breath works. We take in the Holy Spirit. But again, if you just come to church because you want to take it all in and you want to hold it, you experience what that's like. It makes you anxious and nervous. In fact, the waste product of sin in this fallen world will build up in your system and make you uncomfortable. And there's no more God to be taken in if you're holding your breath. You see where I'm going? Hey, everybody, it's Pastor Bill. We had some technical difficulties with the rest of the sermon. Apparently, someone didn't want us to hear that. So what I'm going to do is briefly walk you through the rest of the sermon. This is a slide that we left off on where I made the point that when Jesus breathes onto the disciples, he also mentions the sending of the Holy Spirit. And while the words are different in the original uh, Hebrew in Genesis 2, the idea is that God's breath does more than just physically animate us. It also animates us in a way that is unique to humankind. So going forward, then, we combine the practicality of breath with the spirituality of breath in a thing called breath prayers. I don't know if any of you have experienced breath prayers, but this was kind of an epiphany for me. The breath prayers are a, a unique thing, not th something that I made up, but it's something that comes from an Eastern Orthodox tradition, or at least that's how I found out about it. Now, this particular screenshot is actually off of an app called Uversion. It's a Bible app that you can download for free. They have plans that you can subscribe to, and this is one of them. It's called Calm Your Anxiety and Restore Your Soul, Seven Breath Prayers. The idea of the breath prayer is such that you can say the prayer within a breath. So just by example, some of the things that you look for when you come to a breath prayer are, one, that it's actually rooted in Scripture, and then know the context of that Scripture. What I mean by that is we don't just make up you know, mantras or, or whatever. Uh, from a Christian perspective, we root the prayer in Scripture. It's the Word of God that is working through us then. And if you take a brief segment of that, enough to say in a breath, I also encourage you to know the context from which you're taking that scripture. Because as you say these breath prayers, the whole context can play in your mind in a picture. So that's the first requirement in a, in a breath prayer. The second one is, this is not about mindlessness. It's about mindfulness. In some traditions in meditation, the goal is to empty the mind. But here's been my practical experience. Nothing uh, sucks things in like a vacuum. You know, nature abhors a vacuum, right? So if you have this emptiness, empty mind, so many other things attempt to be pulled in, and then it becomes this contest of can I keep it all out? The approach I love about a Christian meditation is your mind is so full of Christ that nothing else can get in. It's not that I'm trying to empty it. I'm actually trying to fill it with Christ. So that's what this means when I say mind full versus mind less. The third criteria is this is about connecting, not disconnecting. We're not trying to have an out-of-body experience. We're not trying to shut down the world. We're actually trying to connect with the one who made us and who loves us. This is a, a, an important part. Uh, as you say, a breath prayer, it sounds pretty shallow, but it, it's connecting to a God who's absolutely huge. And then finally, this is how it's done. You take a phrase, uh, preferably from Scripture, and you break it down such that you can say a part of that phrase on the inhale and a part of that phrase on the exhale. One example that I've used before and is also in the study I mentioned is you say, the Lord is my shepherd on the inhale. You hold for five seconds. You already know how to breathe like a, like a Navy SEAL, right? You hold for five seconds. On the exhale, you say, I have everything I need. You hold. You inhale. The Lord is my shepherd. 
I have everything I need. And you continue to repeat that over and over. Again, having the context of the scripture, you know everything that goes on with that. So no matter what's going on, you have the assurance of the physical part of breathing, that your body is actually attuned to settle down. Your body gets the signal that everything's okay. And you have a sense of peace and calm about that. But in this case, you're also getting God's word. Your soul is feeling that same thing. It's a it's integrity of the prayer of the body and soul. So you get that reassurance. And it can be done at any time. It can be done standing in a line. It can be done uh, while you're driving if you're not too distracted. Uh, it can be done while you're waiting for whatever else to happen. Uh, it can be done in the middle of busyness. Just stop and say a breath prayer or two. And the more that you do it, the more meaning it will carry for you. The other thing that we can do practically is to journal. Uh, I don't know how many of you journal, but it's a good thing to do for two reasons. One, you can always look back later and see where God was at work. Maybe you don't see it right in the moment, but if you give it time and you reflect back on it and you can remember it, that's my problem. I sometimes forget. But if you can remember it, you can see where God was at work. Uh, the other thing that's good about writing it down is it causes you to slow down and really uh, absorb what's going on. So just taking the time to write in a journal and having it there before you and having the ability to reflect back on it is, is a good thing. I would also like to encourage you, if you are listening to the first part of this, where I ask people to rate their gratitude on a scale from 1 to 10, as well as their anxiety on a scale of 1 to 10. And just keep track of that through your journal as you go. And the reason is I want to see if there's actually this inverse proportion that the more gratitude I have, the less anxiety I have, or the less gratitude I have, the more anxiety I have. I'm curious what your results are, and I hope that you'll share that with us. So all of these things are practical things that we can do to have the physical effects of breathing and health, along with the spiritual effects of breathing the spirit of God in a healthy relationship in that way. I encourage you to attempt this practice uh, because uh, breath is that gift that keeps on giving. It costs us nothing, but gives us everything. So words are, if it's true that breathing can be a form of gratitude and gratitude can be a form of release from anxiety and stress and cares and concerns and become more connected with God, then I would say that we're just one breath away from a life that is different. Thank you for tuning in. We're going to cut back into the service so you can hear the end of it. But thank you for your patience. But thank you for your love for God and neighbor. And thank you for just taking the next breath. This is Pastor Bill. Out. God, if it's true that you are our shepherd, then we have everything we need. And that's something to be grateful for. That's something to have confidence in. God, if it were up to us, we would not be confident in ourselves to supply that. But we're not talking about us. Uh, we're talking about the creator of the universe. We're talking about the one who never fails. We're talking about the one who will never forsake us, never abandon us. We're talking about the one who would even give a son for the likes of us. For that, we have confidence. And in confidence, we have peace. Pray all this in Jesus' name. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. I know there's peace within your presence. I speak Jesus.
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness of every end. Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name. Church, come on, we say. Cause I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every life. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. earlier I told you that that sending out would be important because we are not sent out of our own and on our own. We are sent out in the spirit. The spirit of the one who heals. The spirit of the one who has power. The spirit of the one who gives us peace. I speak Jesus. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and speak Jesus to a world who desperately needs to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for coming.